and even um, because emotions I heard as I remember get stuck in 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 adhesions is that correct yes right see as I, I as I try to recall all of this and she doesn't like canned food for her animals she, she said it's vitamin deficient because they're not exposed to the sun and um, of course likes her vitamin D and magnesium to control the immune system so just trying to recall all of these good stuff from Dr. Marlene and now she's here again to give us case studies to let us more, uh, know more about our uh, furry friends here. So I'll, 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 get, I'll leave the floor to you, Ms. Marlene, and it's all to you now. Thank you. Okay. So warning, some of my slides will be a little bit of graphic, but uh, nothing that we can't handle. All right, so this is not grandma's veterinary medicine. It is very, very different. And I'm so blessed to be working in an industry where my patients always think we are wonderful. This is Maggie. We did introduce her once before. I just want to break the myth of the age that animals should be living to. We have so many animals living into their 30s and mid 30s. This is Echo. He's my cat. Um, he did transition at 23, but he looked this good until the week he transitioned. We know that cancer rates are high in people, they're higher in animals. One out of 1.65 dogs getting cancer now. Cats, one out of three, highly underreported. And when we include obesity, autoimmune disease, arthritis, allergies, and gastrointestinal disease, we're seeing literally 100% of our animals having some form of disease, mostly chronic degenerative diseases. And the worst part is they're living seven years shorter than they did 20 years ago. So we're definitely doing something wrong. It's not just to ourselves and the pets, we're doing it to the planet. The World Wildlife Fund did a retrospective study where they were studying two, it was two major universities that did the study and they were looking at vertebrate species. It was began in 1970 and went through 2014. It was a 44 year retrospective study. And what they saw was that there has been a 58% reduction in all vertebrate species on this planet. The bird populations are down by 35% unless they live near fresh water, and then they're down by 78%. When a species reaches 72% in reduction of population, they are at risk for extinction. Guys, we are right behind them. We can't survive without nature. They are the key to our existence. Just looking at honeybees alone, they are responsible for over 100 crops and providing 90% of the world's food. So 71% of these crops are pollinated by bees. And in North America, honey bees pollinate over 95 kinds of fruits and seeds and apples and all these things that are so, so important. So I just had two beehives and they suddenly died. And I think it has a lot to do with the pesticides around me. Of course, I don't use any within my own place. And then my definition of dis-ease, because I don't believe there is actually disease, it's a deficiency of essential nutrients that the body needs to be able to function properly. It's an excess of toxins, and in most cases, it's a combination of deficiency and toxicity along with mitochondrial dysfunction. This is the six keys that I use for every single case. So if you see any of my cases, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the each nuance, but if you're interested, you could always... Um, ask me and I'll go over them with you. But number one is stopping the pollution. We have to stop doing the things that are causing disease. Number two is supplying the essential nutrients. Those are the ones the body cannot produce in sufficient quantity on its own. We have to eat them. Number three, just like in people, we have to heal the leaky gut. Number four is detoxification of all six organs of elimination. So we have the kidney, the colon, the lungs, the liver, the skin. And I now include lymph and fascia together because the fascia is everything and the lymph runs through the fascia. So we really need to address both. And then of course, mitochondrial function, we need to have the biggest, healthiest, most productive mitochondria. And last but not least, I clear trapped emotions because we know that all dis-ease has trapped emotions associated with it. If any of you would like to share the six keys with friends or family that have pets, you can go to holistichealingvet.com and it's a free download. I do want to mention a little bit about water because I am a water snob and I think that it is one of the most important and yet misaddressed areas for us. 
And I know most of you understand, they, you've done some work with Gerald Pollack or you know who he is. And he certainly is the one that helped to bring to light that there are four phases of water, not three. And we have this gel phase between the liquid and the solid. It comes under many names. It, it's called structured water, fourth phase water, easy water, ordered water, coherent water, liquid crystalline state. It's also called bioelectric water. But this water makes up our blood, it makes up our fascia, it's in all of our tissues, it's in all of our cells, including our bone and bone marrow. When an individual is 2% dehydrated, it leads to measurable cognitive loss. And if they're 10% dehydrated, it can lead to chronic illness. I would say a good percentage of my cases have a degree of dehydration and usually more than 2% just based on skin turgor. And we do blood work and of course, we're able to verify that. And the human body must have structured water in order to make it bioavailable. So at a cellular level, we only absorb structured water. This is what Dr. Pollack calls his easy water and the easy stands for exclusion zone. So as that easy water is, is a surrounding a material, could be a cell or an organelle, as it expands, it pushes out the negative components into the, or the toxins into the bulk water. Infrared light is one of the things that can cause the expansion of easy water. And think about the fact that we're not getting outside very much anymore. Like I make a point of going outside, we're still on curbside. So I'm outside all the time and I love it. But this importance of how light can actually expand that fourth phase of water is critical. And this fourth phase water is actually a different concentration. It's H3O2, it's 10% denser than H2O2, and it has more dissolved oxygen in it. This easy water collects radiant energy, it could be sunlight, it could be other forms of radiant energy, and it converts it into a chemical energy. So this is what it looks like. You have a nucleus, whatever, the easy water is the negative pole around it. And when it is expanded, it causes all of the positive solutes to go out into the bulk water. It's actually what allows bugs to have surface tension and walk across the water. We have aquaporins that are in our cells and it's what allows the water to flow into the cell. But that aquaporin is the size of a structured water molecule, not an unstructured. So when we are fully hydrated, it typically means that we have good structured water that is able to go into the cell. Why we need cellular hydration? Well, it's plugged into our biophysics through this water molecule. It makes an energetic connection. The DNA strand has to be coated with this fourth phase water in order to have proper DNA expression. And then when we deal with protein folding, if we don't have that structured water, we're going to get some abnormalities in protein folding. Uh, the structured water is the interface for the enzymes to be functional. So super, super important. Here are some of the things that are contributing to cellular dehydration, living indoors all the time under artificial environments, not getting outside into fresh air and sunshine, conditioned air or conditioned heat, like I mean, everybody's cold right now in the winter time, and so they're running the heat. Highly processed, I call it bad food, but a lot of chemicals and additives in that food that cause it to be dehydrating. The lack of exercise, lack of high intensity movement. So a lot of people think they can walk their dog to go potty and that's enough exercise. It's nowhere near good exercise. And of course, the use of computers and cell phones, EMF and blue light is also very damaging. Prescription medications, contaminated water sources, and air pollution, mold, formaldehyde, fire retardants, and petroleum products. So when we're talking about this fourth phase water and cellular hydration, stress can actually cause these molecules to act differently. And we live in a world which is nonstop sympathetic tone, nonstop stress. And our poor little animals, they, they don't know what they're in stress over, but they just know that we're in stress and so they entrain to us. But we also have a lot of toxins, the herbicides, pesticides, chemicals, heavy metals, EMF and antibiotics that are in the food or given to the animals or it's in the environment. The tap water contains tons of heavy metals from lead, arsenic, chromium, strontium, and our friend glyphosate. I say that facetiously. 
So we're getting all this folding, misfolding of proteins, which is your hallmark for chronic degenerative conditions. Cognitive dysfunction is such a big deal in animals these days. We've never seen it so bad. And then neurologic disorders, type one diabetes, liver disease, kidney disease, and of course, astronomical numbers of cancer. So hydration is the basis of all of our cell biology, and yet we don't pay Jump enough attention. Jumping off a cliff into shark-infested waters on Epstein's Island as a means of... Can you mute everybody in the background? Um, so hydration is the basis of all of our cell biology. So this is a live blood uh, light field microscopy. We see our red blood cells, and we know this to be normal. The cells are supposed to be separated, and what's separating them is that fourth phase of water. It's having that correct polarity. This is Rouleau, and when I went to vet school, they literally taught us that this is normal in cats and horses. It is so not normal in any species. So I just want to mention that there are really good water systems out there, and I just won't go over this slide in depth, but if you're interested in knowing about systems that do high filtration, help to maintain proper mineralization, produce molecular hydrogen, which is very critical to be able to give us an antioxidant to meet our oxidative stress. I like my system that uses a magnesium reaction because it doesn't run on electricity. And I love companies that have good scientific testing behind them, certification, great customer service, and of course, company integrity. So contact me if you want to know a system. This is a little product that we use from Therasage that structures water. I'm going to play the little video and it basically mimics what the plants go through when it's taking in sun energy. And so it produces this structured mist that comes out. And for people, they would actually put the little nasal cannula in. For animals, they won't wear the nasal cannula. So we just have it airing into the room. And if we play it, before the animal goes into the room, they're still getting the benefit of this water that they're breathing in structured, which then helps to structure the water in their body. Another way that you could do this is to take organic herbs that were grown outside in the sun and add it to your drinking water. So if you grow rosemary or stevia or basil or mint, whatever, you can put that in your water, stir it around, let it sit for a few minutes, and that will literally structure the water that you're drinking because the water in the plant is already structured. Species appropriate diet for you and I, we are omnivores and I'll let people argue what they prefer to eat, but we are omnivores, we can eat both. Dogs are carnivores. They were designed to kill an animal and eat it in the state that they killed it in. If nature intended them to have a kibble, they would have design some form of a kibble processing in the wild. Nature didn't do that. So they really have to eat a species appropriate diet in order to truly sustain their body. And cats are obligate carnivores. They have no dietary requirement for carbohydrates. Their species appropriate biological diet is the composition of a mouse. Doesn't mean you have to go out and get mice, put them in your Vitamix and give it to your cat. I'm just saying the composition needs to be composition of a mouse. And then we have to supplement with the essential vitamins, minerals, fatty acids, amino acids, and pre and probiotics in order for that animal to really be sustained. Now we're going to get into how we start our treatments. And we all know that you only heal in a parasympathetic state. If we are in a very high state of stress, if we're in high sympathetic tone, or we have activated our cell danger response mode, that branch of the vagus nerve that tells the mitochondria there's so much danger, you have to go into the bunker and hide, you can't heal. So the first thing we do is get our patients into a PEMF device. And as far as I know, this is the only machine in the world that operates at the picotesla ranges. So it's very, very low frequency, and it entrains to the body's frequencies, the tissue, and breaks it back into its harmonic state. And then we have full spectrum infrared. We do have it in a sauna form, like on the right. We have the built-in saunas where everybody can go in, but the animals really like the pads. And these are full spectrum pads, low EMF, and I just put the pad down and my cat just jumped right on it. 
We also do assisted lymphatic therapy because we all know that the two most important organs of detoxification are the lymphatics and the liver. So we use a machine that produces a microcurrent, negative ions, and inert gases. And there's a particular path that you go all over the body and increase the flow of lymph, open the drainage areas. And these animals really talk Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, your voice, we can't hear you. I don't know what happened to the sound. But it has been almost a year that we've been campaigning a new year. <laughs> Touching every hand, um, answering every question, being the last person on the and we had um, a big thing happen. Is the second that and then you want to add your video, you just click this, okay? She's talking. I mean, it's true, Governor, that doesn't stand behind a podium. He shows up at a diner. He shows up at the brewery. He loves the people of New Hampshire. He has been with me every single day at every single event. Chris, I couldn't. And I want to thank you. Okay, I know Chris Gary Joe will like this. Do what I do. Gary, not even look. Presidential response, what do you think? I'm going to get Dr. back Bill? to where I was. Dr. Bill, can you hear me? What? You want me to put this on her? No. no I, I pulled out the antibiotic. I know. It's, uh, oh, you did? Where is it? It's on the table in there. Oh. Yeah, same here. I was going to go out and come back in. Yeah, let's try to do that. Let's log yeah. off. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Can we just get it back? Was it still there? Didn't you close it? No, I didn't. I don't know. Can we hear you now? I can't hear her. And Marley? I don't know how to get out. Yeah. I don't know how to get out start over. <laughs> I'll enjoy location A. I'm in location A and I don't know how to get out of it. Uh, does Marlene know that we can't hear her? Okay, Marlene, we can't hear you. I don't think she can hear us. Which location is she in? I just went to remote. Yeah, but how do I get to remote? Oh. I can't get there myself. I, mean, I just it it's asked me where I wanted to go, and I, I just I need to join her room. Join this is so wacky. I know. Yeah. And okay. Now I'm there. Now I got David Dahl. Okay. Marlene, can you speak? You can hear her? Nope. nope. Kyle, are you here? I I can't hear her. I'm going with, I want remote and camera. It makes a difference. Remote definitely doesn't work. I'm going to try to rejoin. I'm going to click a different one this time. How do you get that rejoin? All right. Marlene, we can't hear you. Where's the chat? Yeah. <laughs> So, I don't know. I, I don't know what to do with this damn thing. And look at me this time. Still can't hear. No. I'm sorry, everybody. I, I don't know what to do. And uh, my, my assistant here is not here. 
Uh, Dr. Bill, maybe we can let Dr. Marlene reset her and then let her go out and go in again. Well, then it's like suddenly it seemed as if when you joined, then that's where we got an option to go well, to different rooms. Okay. Dr. Marlene is in remote. She's I in was in remote as well. Her mic's I off. Her mic I'm in remote. remote also. Who am I talking to? Kelvin. Okay. Well, her, her, her remote's off. I mean, her microphone's off, but she's in the remote group. Says your microphone's off, Marlene. Under my end. <clears throat> okay. That didn't work. Anything else go wrong? <laughs> What is that? She asked to turn mic on, asked to turn mic on, asked to, Stephen, you're, oh, Stephanie, can you can hear us? I can hear you, Bill. I can't hear Marlene. Um, I'm talking. You can't hear me? No. Now we can. Yeah. Yes, we can now. You can't hear me. Okay. Wow. I have no idea. I think when somebody muted the group, it muted even me. And I had to, I, I just kept clicking on stuff. So I can see I'm unmuted now. Oh, we're good now? Yeah, where did, where did you lose me? The attic therapy. Okay, so let me go back to there, share screen. Sorry. And um, let's do it the lymphatic. The uh, family members can go in with their. With the kitty cat. Or they can lay on the pad. Oh, so further back? I think, uh, no, keep going. We, we saw the one. I think uh, the one. Okay. The familiar. It's on the dog's nose. Were you there? Okay, you were there? At the one, yep. Okay, so I was just saying that with this particular lymphatic machine, it uses a microcurrent negative ions and inert gases, and it allows me to go really deep into the body, and we can gauge how deep or superficial we want to go, depending on the patient's needs, and boosting natural killer cells and aiding in detoxification. And then, uh, well-tolerated, we try to get a lot of our patients to do this on a regular basis. We don't wait till they have cancer. The next thing that we do a lot is fascia decompression. We do have a course that we have our pet parents take. They can, they go to my website and then they just click on the link. And I showed this case in one of our previous talks where he had this big mass on his leg and we took the mass off and he was unable to walk normally because all that weight that he'd had for so long caused his body to bow out. So on the left, you can see how his chest is bowing out to the left. This is literally the day of surgery where we'd taken the mass off and he was very weak on the left side. He couldn't even move his leg. We see that he's ballooning on his left rib cage and very sunken in on the right. Watch his left hind leg. It just moves really stiff. We just took off that huge thing on his left. So that was fascia and then we had the owner doing some of the fascia work at home and we complimented it and you can see him in this I'm video seeing him still a little ballooned out but just way straighter day of working on chest and then uh, of course we kept working on him and this dog was walking normally in under 72 hours the next thing we do after we get their lymph flowing is we put them into a foot detox bath which uses electrolysis also aids in parasympathetic and pulling out toxins and heavy metals. And then if they are big, we just put their front or back feet in. If they're little, they just do a body dunk. And again, very well tolerated. Then we do uh, low level light therapy or photobiomodulation. And remember, this is where we're activating body cycles using light. So this is an internal mechanism and here we are doing a laser therapy with a handheld laser on an external. And my daughter and I are in Mexico getting an IV therapy as well. You have to try it before you have your patients do it. And then this is intra-articular where we have a cruciate, we put photo activators and different products intralesional, and then we photo activate it. So we can use our laser therapy intravenously, intra-articular, intralesional, and topical. This is the very first dog in the United States to receive photodynamic therapy. 
And that's where we take a photo activator, we activate it by light, and we cause uh, tissue death or cancer, cancer death, cell death, abnormal cells. And uh, he was a bone cancer case I presented once before. This is ozone. I think most of us use ozone. I love using it as a major autohemotherapy, and we also use ultraviolet blood irradiation with it. Minor autohemotherapy, more as an autosanguinous, rectally bubbled through oil, using the ozonide sub-Q, lavaging things with it, oral rinse, acupuncture, so many different applications. This little dog is an example of all the different ways that we can use ozone. And we do most of them. I don't do a lot of limb bagging just because it's really challenging to keep the bag tight around a limb, but we do almost everything else. And for most of us, we haven't ever really had the opportunity to see what rectal ozone does to the fourth phase of water. So on the left is a live blood analysis of a dog and the cells are all gnarly and crinkled. The fourth phase of water is quite collapsed. And then we did rectal ozone. And on the right is the same dog 10 minutes after rectal ozone. And there's a profound change to the fourth phase of water and to the cells themselves. So now they're really able to do their job properly. This is another application for ozone whenever we don't want to use an antibiotic. I think most of us are aware of the fact that we won't have antibiotics in 10 years. So we are looking for different ways that we can use ozone and laser to not have to use antibiotics. So this is a dog with an anal gland infection. So I'm going to squeeze the anal gland. You'll see the blood come out. And then I'm going to take a catheter, a little Tomcat catheter, go into the gland. So you see I'm in the gland now because the blood comes up. And now I'm going to gently flush that with ozonated saline. For most of our patients, we'll do this over a period of three to four days. The owners come back in, we flush it once a day. And usually by the end of the fourth or fifth day, the infection is gone. There's no more blood and they don't need to be on any antibiotics. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, we do a ton of. So I'm on the left diving with two of my cancer patients, and on the right is another one of my cancer patients, and I'm just showing how roomy it is in there. We all fight for who gets to dive with the pets, and most of our pets go in by themselves as well. We do vibration and sound frequency. This is a machine that does both, and the animals just sit on the vibration plate. We can adjust the frequency, and then we have different frequency settings that we can do to also entrain to the body tissues. Halo therapy, which is dry salt therapy. Sometimes we go in with our patients, sometimes we let them go in. But it's wonderful for cleaning the sinuses, the whole entire upper respiratory tract, and also for skin disease. We get a lot of animals with allergies and hot spots and seborrhea and superficial moist dermatitis and putting them in the salt booth and letting that salt just kind of uh, coat them is just wonderful. We use a crystal fusion light therapy in a lot of our patients. Different colors produce different effects on the body. This is doing a minor autohemotherapy on a dog that had a bunch of little tumors. Really, who was the first person that did acupuncture? I always wonder, you know, here this little mammoth is going, wow, my neck feels better. And as he's getting pummeled by all these spears, so we do a lot of acupuncture. Now I want to get into what we're really missing here in traditional medicine. So we had little Ziva. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of her. She was a one-year-old female spayed Australian shepherd that was having skin problems, skin rashes, and her mom was very astute. She realized that it may be related to the kibble diet, and she wanted to find out what she could do differently. So we did a full workup on her. Now keep in mind, this dog is one year old. This is the nutrient panel. And as you can see, extremely deficient in zinc, selenium, magne manganese, um, copper, and even magnesium, which is amazing. This is a one year old dog. And then vitamin D insufficient, hyaluronic acid is our test for looking at osteoarthritis. This dog has a high index for showing positive osteoarthritis at a year of age. The TK1 is quite elevated, which was consistent with either osteoarthritis, cancer, or Lyme's disease, anything that causes tissue or cell necrosis, and then also had a mild level of inflammation. 
on the toxic metals for this dog, antimony almost off the charts, pretty high in cobalt, which I think must be coming from the diet because the cobalt is the thinner molecule in 12. And so normally we, if the dog is getting a normal level of B12, you wouldn't be seeing these high levels of cobalt. In people, it's usually from titanium implants, but our animals don't have any titanium implants. So I can only speculate that this is coming from a dietary supplementation. This is Bobby. Oh, needless to say, we changed her diet. We are detoxing her from the toxicities. We are making up her nutrient deficiencies. Her leaky gut has resolved and her skin has cleared up and she's doing amazing. This is Bobby. I met Bobby when he was a puppy. He was born in 2016. So I saw him that year. I was doing pre-op blood because the owners wanted to neuter him. And his ALT was 729, very, very high, as you can see in the red. And we started working him up to see what the problem was. And he turned out to have a hepatic shunt. His was a microvascular dysplasia, so it was not a surgical candidate. So this dog, since that time, has come in every month. He has a PEMF treatment. We do IV ozone, major autohemotherapy, and periodic chiropractic adjustments he's on a raw diet with proper supplementation, I thought. <laughs> and so his liver enzymes have remained almost in normal range for all these years now. Well, he came in last month and he had a heart murmur. When I talked to the owners, I didn't realize as we were working him up and I'm seeing all these abnormalities that they, they were still using a diet that we had been using almost seven years ago. So somehow they hadn't got the memo that they needed to quit buying food online and, uh, and feed a better diet. So the diet that they were using, though it was raw, they used synthetic vitamins and minerals. And as you can see, his magnesium is low, he's insufficient with vitamin D, and even his cobalamin is low on B12. So that just goes to show you that these diets that are using synthetic nutrients are not supplementing these animals appropriately. So once we figured out what he was on, we take we took him off of that diet, put him on a GMO-free raw diet that we produce, got him off the synthetic vitamins, off the fish oils, and onto plant-based essential fats and proper uh, vitamins and minerals, and he's doing much better. This is Suki. I just wanted to present this case because she had gone to a referral center for vomiting, they did a partial workup on her and her liver enzymes were over 9,000. They diagnosed her with liver disease, gave her a poor prognosis. They got the diarrhea and vomiting under control and then told the lady they, she needed to go find a regular vet. She came to me, this was her live blood the day she came in. Not only does she have a lot of rouleau, but all that bouncy stuff in the background is fat. Now this dog had already been fasted for seven hours. She should not have had that much fat in her blood. We did her triglycerides, which we got back the next day, 2,500, which is extremely high. I don't know about for people, but really high in animals. And so we immediately started to transition her to a raw diet and we put her in our PEMF device. And we did that for three days in a row. So this is her coming out of that PEMF device day one. She's just been in it for an hour. She came out. We did her live blood again. We still see that she has some fat in her background. We're just now getting her on enzymes and changing her diet. She hadn't eaten for 12 hours, 50% less of the chylose. But look at how pretty those cells are. So just that PEMF device was able to expand that fourth phase of water. Now they look pretty. We didn't get the live blood on day two, but this is day three. Now you can look at that background and it's nice and clear. Those cells are moving, they have flow, they have life to them. We rechecked her triglycerides and they were down to 125. That was drug free. We literally put her in a PEMF device, expanded the fourth phase of water, got her in a parasympathetic state and started her diet change with some enzymes. Pretty remarkable. I can hear you guys applauding in the background. Okay, so 
This is Bobby. He came in. He was actually from France. And when he came into the United States, he had this really severe nasal congestion and just dripping snot. Couldn't breathe. Cats that can't breathe won't eat very well. And so the mom had taken him to several veterinarians and they just kept piling this guy on with more and more antibiotics and antihistamines and he just didn't get better. So we changed his diet. We started working on his gut. We worked on his lymphatic system, got him in the PEMF device, salt room every day, infrared sauna, and light therapy. So this was him. Of course, when we started the salt room, it really got a lot of that snot moving and coming out. He was also AIDS positive. So he had a very challenged immune system and he was a challenging personality. He would bite the cheeches out of me if I gave an opportunity. Here he is in the salt room with his mom. He bit her, went all the way through her hand, and <laughs> she's still smiling. And then we had to take some x-rays of him, and we discovered that he had a little lung tumor going on. We continued our path of salt therapy and all the other things that we were doing. And not only did his lungs clear up and his snotty nose went away, but that mass in his chest also went away. So there's happy Bobby being able to breathe. This is Bam Bam, an Italian greyhound that was out in the backyard and then suddenly was having respiratory problems. The owner had no idea what happened. She rushed the dog into an emergency clinic, came to me the next day, and it turns out this dog had an inhalation pneumonia. So whatever she smelled out there in the yard, it went right into that right lung field. And we did not use any antibiotics. We did salt therapy along with our sonic therapy and rectal ozone and cleared up within three days, lungs back to normal, did not have to use antibiotics, and she's been fine ever since. Um, she did have elevated liver enzymes, but they were elevated for a long time. This is Isis. She's a little English bulldog that is now eight and a half years old and has a really long chronic history of pneumonia, chronic seborrhea. She comes in routinely for salt therapy, rectal ozone, sonic therapy, lymphatic therapy, and hyperbaric oxygen. It is so effective for her, both the respiratory tract and her skin, that the owner has now bought a hyperbaric chamber so he can do that at home with her. So here she is on the right, and the little dog on the left is Ellie. And Ellie came to us as a 14-year-old with collapsing trachea. What happens in some of these dogs is the cartilage and the tracheal rings start to deteriorate. And it's all part of the inflammatory response. It's, it's a degeneration of the cartilage in the trachea. And it sort of acts like the end of a balloon when it gets really floppy. These dogs have very poor quality of life, no exercise tolerance. She had gone to her veterinarian and they said there's nothing they can do. They can just put her to sleep. And we started working with Ellie very intensely. We got her to lose a lot of weight because she was quite obese. And she was able to restore to 100% quality of life. And she's still doing fantastic. And her cough is resolved. This is a Lyme's case. This was Smud. She went to his veterinarian in uh, Connecticut on Christmas Day back in 2020. Acutely painful, screaming. You can see the back of his head is shaved because at the referral center he was at in Connecticut, they did a spinal tap. His white blood cell count was 91 thousand, very high. They tested him for Lyme's disease, but I'm pretty sure by then it had already gone intracellular. So they assumed he didn't have it. They did all kinds of antibiotics and steroids. Then they tried to, and he got better, but then when they started to wean off the steroids, of course, he relapsed in a bad, bad way. He came to me as he was starting to wean off of his steroids. He still had a high white count of almost 30,000 with a high neutrophil count. His platelets were elevated. His muscle enzymes were high. Liver enzymes a little bit elevated. Alkfos was elevated probably from the steroids. And so we started working with him. His copper and calcium were high, really, really high compared to his other nutrients. He was low in zinc and lithium. His antimony, strontium, mercury, arsenic, and lead levels were moderately high. And he was deficient in vitamin D, which we know is integral into the innate immune system. So he had a lot of problems going on. His TK1, super, super high. We did a bioenergetic scan on him and he was Lyme's positive. He also had inflammation out of the wazoo, which is why this guy was so painful. So these were his treatments. He came in and of course he got into a PEMF state and ozone and 
the Thayer air. We wanted to structure the water. He was in the hyperbaric chamber every day. We did chiropractic, laser, acupuncture, changed his diet, coffee enemas, all of the supplements to help balance him out. A lot of lymphatic therapy and foot bath and salt room. And within the first treatment day, he was able to move. Um, the owner sent me this, so the quality is pretty poor, but you can see this dog physically would not move when he came in and he walked up to his mommy who was very happy and then he continued to get better and better the tk1 even though the the inflammation of crp went down to normal within a very short period of time which is why he felt so much better the tk1 had actually gone up a little bit or quite a bit <laughs> and that was probably because we were still getting some cell death from intracellular replication of the spirochete the dog was doing great so here he came in, unable to lift his head and very painful. And then after just a few weeks of therapy, he was running around like a madman and a happy little dog. This is Zeke. He had ruptured a cruciate. This is typically what we'll see our cruciate ruptures look like. Um, oftentimes it's only one leg and they just hop around. This dog had had a ruptured cruciate for almost a year and the owners couldn't decide if they wanted to do surgery because he was 11. And so finally they decided they wanted to do the PRP prolotherapy and we included photodynamic therapy. So I'm going to show you, there's already a needle in the medial All aspect. All right, we're doing the other side. It feels a little more you full because I can... You can actually hear the ozone gas that just came out, so I know I'm in my joint. I'm gonna put it in my solution first. Ozone gas in. I feel a little bit of resistance. And then my fiber optic needle. Good. And then we'll hook our legs up. For the reason I do two needles and I go into the medial lateral aspect of the stifle joint is so that we can cut our anesthesia time in half. Um, that way we could get all the colors in. So here is the red light, just really lighting up the knee joint. And these guys do so well. This is him. You saw him limping and not using his left hind leg. This is going home post-op, literally the same day. And he lived all the way into his almost 15 years doing fantastic. This dog who is on the floor came to me after having been to an emergency clinic. The emergency clinic incorrectly diagnosed him with luxating patellas. And what he actually had done was rupture both of his cruciates. He's grossly overweight and he physically could not stand up. He didn't have a leg to stand on. And so we um, got him worked up and uh, did the surgery where we did both knees. And then we sent him home with the laser. But here's the owner's comments here. Okay, now. Come on. Come on. Show Dr. Siegel what you can do. Come on. This is the first time he's been able to get up on his own without having a brace to carry him. Look at you! So you can tell the parents are so into seeing these dogs improve. And uh, we kept a laser at home for them a little bit longer, changed his diet, got him on good supplements. And this is him in September, a few months down the road. He is down to 85 pounds, lost a dog. And the only bobble that he'll make is when he goes to make the corner, you'll see him kind of cross his feet right there. But other than that, he's walking, he has quality of life. He never had to have surgery and he is doing fantastic. So this is Kim. You actually saw Kim on a previous episode. She had a intervertebral disc rupture and she was paralyzed. But here her mom crying when this dog became paralyzed. I didn't see the dog for several months and because they went to a referral center and they 
could the owners couldn't afford the cost of the surgery and then they finally found me we were able to work with the dog very intensely for seven days here so she is cute. walking <laughs> happy mommy However, the family kind of went back to their old ways, put her back on processed foods, and about four, year late, four years later, she became paralyzed again, and they came back and said, please perform a miracle. So we got her walking again, mm. but um, she, one year later, and this is recent now, she developed cancer on her chest and big old mass on her chest. It's not really associated with the mammary gland, but, you know, again, it's just this dog gave them so many opportunities to try and improve her lifestyle. But when you keep going back to that old lifestyle, you keep getting the same old, same old, and the body just finally says, okay, you're not going to listen. Here you go. This was another dog who came in, was paralyzed. He had tried to jump on the bed and he missed. And the owner thought nothing of it. The next morning they woke up and he was paralyzed. So here's what they typically look like. Now he's a big dog to be paralyzed. It's a little harder to work with. Um, we're calling him and trying to get him to come to us and you can see he can just drag his rear end. This is him in about 10 days. Now he doesn't have a normal gait. If you notice, he looks like a pacer. Instead of um, alternating his feet, he's got both the right sides going and the left sides going like a pacer. However, he's walking and within another few weeks, he was back to being perfectly normal. And we just did work on him every day. This was Moon. We did see her in the fascia course. She had presented back uh, in 2020 for transitional cell carcinoma. We resolved that in a matter of 10 weeks. She also had a big lipoma on her side, this was the cancer in her bladder, totally resolved at the end of the five weeks, actually. And then this lipoma that she had had been there for years with our cancer therapies ruptured, like we literally melted it out of her body. And uh, this almost killed her because she was super, super toxic. So um, it had just ruptured. And so this abscess opened up. You can see my fingers going all the way around into this area. So what I decided to do, since this dog's microbiome had already been so compromised, is I put a drain tube in, and I never used antibiotics. We, she was in the hyperbaric chamber every day. We were able to put our laser, has a utility probe. We were able to literally put it into the wound after we flushed it with ozone and laser it every day with red light and blue light. Healed up beautifully. A few months later, she was still having a lot of really high CRP and her thyroid was real low and we couldn't figure out what the underlying stress still was. We knew there was no cancer, we kept looking and it turned out she was trying to get rid of her port. So what we're seeing here is her um, port starting to come through the skin. She didn't need it anymore. So she said, here, get out of me. We took the port out and she was fine. However, she ended up about a year later coming in with this idiopathic vestibular syndrome. So idiopathic, it means we don't know why they happen, but they get this um, cold snap happens and they're left with this wobbliness, the head tilt. You can see here, she um, just goes in a circle and her head is tilted over and she was pretty weak in the rear end. So we started doing the fascia decompression work on her. This is one of the exercises that we did, making her go to the opposite direction of her head tilt and a variety of other exercises that we did. And then we had the owners do it at home as well. Pay real close attention to this video because she's going to come right at you. Notice there's no head tilt. This is unheard of in a vestibular case. I've never in my 40 years have seen this resolve. They always are left with the head tilt. And then on the right hand side, the strength in her rear end was astronomical, where before she used to be really weak, her legs would shake even when she squatted to pee, she could almost fall down. And now she is absolutely thriving. This is Piper, nine year old female sprayed, spayed mixed breed dog that came in with a mast cell tumor. So they were on her belly, they had these little raised mast cells and they weren't really that dramatic looking. So we put her on a product called Neoplasin, which is basically blood root that's been attenuated. So it's not as, as uh, scary. And the dog did great. All the lesions went away. 
and then the owners didn't keep up with it. So they decided to just not do anything because she was all cleared up. And this is what happened about six months later. It was six months, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two. Yeah, about six months later. So she came in and this just came back with a vengeance. This is another look of what her underside looked like. It was horrific. So now we're trying to catch back up again. We were using, of course, IV therapies, a lot of hyperbaric, uh, different frequencies, mistletoe, uh, variety of, of things to try to reduce the inflammation. And we even did, she was my first case that Mike helped me to do um, methylene blue. So that was pretty cool. And she was actually getting better, but it was a slow process and it was expensive. And the owners were not able to keep up and they took her elsewhere and had her euthanized. But she was doing better. And then this is Chikari, squamous cell carcinoma in the nose. These tumors get really angry when you start treating them. She's in the foot bath, she's in the sauna, she's getting her photo uh, dynamic therapy. Started out in the right nostril, moved into the left nostril in a couple of months, and uh, it was kind of scary looking. And then we just kept going. And then about 16 weeks into it, she came in for therapy and I looked at her and I couldn't see any evidence of cancer. However, what happens on a lot of these animals, and I think it happens in people as well, is they start to kind of slip a little bit on the intensity with which they maintain their microbiome and their lifestyle. And she ended up getting an anal gland carcinoma. So it's a carcinoma that grows from the anal gland. Because it's not visible, the owners were not aware of the fact that she had this massive tumor growing. So by the time she was having trouble pooping, and they brought her in for that. And then I, I found the tumor. We did resect it one time, but it just came back with a vengeance and we were just not able to keep up with the intensity. It was during COVID and they had a lot of other personal things happening in their lives. So she was in the, euthanized. Bentley, you met once before. He was also squamous cell carcinoma where the oncologist told the owners that they have to cut his nose off because it wasn't treatable. And it was whack -a -mo. Every week he came in, there was new lesions coming up. We got very aggressive when it got, it got aggressive. We got more aggressive and it was combinations of lasering it back and topical products because it was on his nose and he's a lab. So he's going to lick everything. We literally have to treat him every week under general anesthesia and then put product over the product that we had on his nose to keep it there while we were waiting for the therapy to do its job. And this is him. He's just so cute. He everywhere he knew he had to go, he would just you call his name, he'd just jump right in the hyperbaric machine. Or if it was time to go on the sonic, he just walked into the room, got on it, and just waited. He loved just coming in. He was a happy dog and we loved him. And then we started to see the lesion start to resolve. And this is such an amazing example. When if I showed you the underside of his lip, it was literally eroded away. I couldn't even imagine how that could even regenerate back. But here it is starting to regenerate back. We did a CT scan. There was no evidence of cancer. And it just continued to heal. But, as there's always a but, um, the little lesion on the inside of his left nostril, you see it along the inside of the planum, we tried to get rid of that. And it just kind of woke everything up. And he ended up... Um, it grew inside of his nose and then he developed a couple subcutaneous lesions as well and ultimately it was his demise but he had a year and a half of amazing quality of life this is raleigh came in with a um, squamous cell carcinoma the eye had already been removed by somebody else and of course they didn't treat the underlying problem so the cancer was coming back we did methylene blue on this which <laughs> i lost sleep i remember calling mike and going did I just kill this cat? Because uh, it's pretty, methylene blue can be pretty toxic for cats, causing Heinz body anemias, but it didn't absorb. It just was a topical application and we didn't have any problems with this cat's blood. Unfortunately, the, the owner didn't keep up with the treatments, but um, it, he did get better. The lesion got um, a lot smaller and he started eating and feeling better and his personality came back, but they just didn't keep up with the treatments. So there mm. we are putting on the methylene blue. Mm. He is under anesthesia, mm. but just very lightly. Mm. Mm. Pretty cool. Mm. This was a lipoma. This is going to look, get a little gross if you are not used to surgery. But this lipoma was so large, it was interfering with the 
this dog's ability to have movement. So we decided to go ahead and remove it. And this is just the intraoperative picture. It was very well encapsulated. So I just literally peeled it out with blunt dissection. And uh, there we go, just working it out, getting it all loosened up from all the adhesions around it. And then this is the lipoma. I've just pulled it all the way out, and then I'm just going to dissect it off of its attachments. And this is Buddy. He had where the arrow was pointing. He had a nerve sheath tumor. It was removed two times by a board-certified surgeon, but because they did not treat the underlying problem, of course, it came back. When he came to me, we started changing his diet, getting his toxins gone and improving his deficiencies. We use this product Neoplasian again, which is a derivative of blood root. And uh, we were able to actually resolve the tumor. And I didn't put the last picture, but it actually had granulated all the way in. Problem was when the dog, they lived in Daytona, so about three and a half hours from me. And the wife literally got tired of feeling, feeding this dog a raw diet. And so she put him back on kibble and a tumor came back above this. So that it never came back in the same location, but it did come back above and then they euthanized. This is a dog that had prostatic cancer. When he came in, he had a belly full of ascites. And at that time, we didn't know what his diagnosis was. So we had to go through this arduous process of ultrasounds and all everything that we had to do to get a diagnosis. So here I am doing an abdominal synthesis, pulling off some of this fluid to make him comfortable. And we started doing all of our cancer therapies and treating this dog for deficiencies and toxicities. And then this one is cool. Listen real carefully. After I've drained off quite a bit of the fluid, I injected ozone gas. He's under anesthesia straight into the abdomen. So listen carefully. And then I mix it up like I just because there's some fluid still left in there. So I literally took my hands and just was kind of sloshing it all around. And this dog even surprised me. All of his peritoneal effusion went away. This dog returned to 100% normal health. And we neutered him too. This is a testicular tumor. This dog had a retained testicle from puppyhood and the owners never went in to remove the retained testicles. So it developed into a tumor, which is rather common. So we took the tumor out and we did a traditional neuter, removed the other testicle that was actually descended. So you can see the size differences. And he did really good for four more years. And then he developed what we, we I don't know if it was lymphoma or a biliary carcinoma, but he developed cancer in his liver. And uh, we, by the time they brought him back to me, it was really far gone and he transitioned in just a couple of days, but that was an amazing tumor. This dog uh, came to me as a referral from another veterinarian. He had been paralyzed. He had had back surgery and the surgery went really south and he was left paralyzed after the surgery. And he, because his owner couldn't empty the bladder sufficiently, this dog developed repetitive UTIs and finally developed a resistant pseudomonas infection. So one of my colleagues knows that I do ozone, so she referred him to me to do ozone in the bladder, get rid of the pseudomonas infection. Well, I was trying to teach the owner how to empty the bladder because we knew it would just get infected again if he couldn't get the bladder expressed. So I took an x-ray to see if he was expressing the bladder sufficiently and on the edge of the x-ray i caught this osteosarcoma because he wasn't walking nobody realized that he couldn't use his back leg because of the cancer as well but he still had great quality of life for quite some time after that this is intestinal lymphoma so i literally this is a necropsy i just cut the intestine in half so that we could all appreciate what that looks like in the intestinal tract it's nasty um, and there's no normal tissue in there. You can see a little bit of mucosa on the left, but nothing was normal. And this dog wasn't able to have bowel movements either. 
We see a lot of oral tumors in cats. This is a squamous cell carcinoma. I don't think you can see a cursor, but if you look at the endotracheal tube and then look underneath it, I have the tongue pulled off to the left side of the screen and the tongue is all involved and all the area under the tongue is involved. And the owners brought this cat in because it wasn't eating. This is a dog that came in, they thought had uh, just osteoarthritis and this dog also was in kidney failure. But my point on this case is that we never treat the lab values, we treat the patient. And this dog was still going around and eating and had pretty decent quality of life. So we focused on what I'm doing here is an electrical stem acupuncture. We did chiropractic work and a variety of other things for the musculoskeletal system. And this dog had amazing quality of life for quite some more months. And then finally, uh, it was time to say goodbye. But the owners were thrilled that they had so much more quality time with him. Cats, real common. In fact, the number one most common disease in cats is kidney failure. This cat came in because it was vomiting. The owner thought it had eaten a little piece of a plant, but uh, that was not the problem. He was in kidney failure and they weren't ready to give up because he wasn't very old. So we started out with pretty high numbers. We were doing the IV fluids along with ozone and we did energy work and chiropractic work and chakras and lymphatic therapy and laser and the PEMF device and we did the Thayer Air, so we structured the water in his body, put him on good nutrition, which we had to force feed at the time he wasn't eating. Here he is getting a lymphatic therapy. Here he is getting his kidneys lasered. And within 24 hours, his numbers were almost back into normal range, which is truly unheard of. Like just fluids would not have done that by itself. This was his live blood on the left. You can see He's got a lot of uh, rouleau and just not real pretty cells. 24 hours into treatment, he's had, of course, some of his lymphatic work, which also separates the fourth phase of water and uh, his PEMF device and laser, and his cells are just remarkably better. So is he. And then his blood work within literally 72 hours was back to normal, and he remained normal. All right, this is gonna get a little gross, guys. Uh, we see a lot of abscesses. This is little Max. He had a big swelling underneath his chin and the owner brought him in. Um, I think he did have a neoplasia along with a tooth root abscess. She didn't have the money to biopsy, so she wanted to do symptomatic treatment. So here we are lasering the abscess. Rabbits are notorious for getting abscesses. Oh, it's gonna go all over me. Technicians should always wear gloves. <laughs> so um, then what we did, because the rabbits are very sensitive yes. to antibiotics. So we did ozone flushing and laser. So this is literally red, well, this is blue light, uh, but we did combinations of red light and blue light literally into the abscess area and a lot of ozone flushing and hyperbaric oxygen. And he did really, really well. This was a bird that came in with a swollen belly and where the air was pointing, that's where her butt is. And all that area below was distended. We took an x-ray and she was egg bound. So we were able to do a surgical procedure to remove the egg and little birdie did great. Um, this was Ellie. We saw her in a previous session where she came in paralyzed and we were able to get her to walk in just four days. Well, Ellie, her mom didn't keep up with her progress. And so she went back on processed foods and recently came in with a bladder full of bladder stones. So she was peeing blood. And when we did the x-ray, we could see all the stones in the bladder. So now you get to see bladder stone removal. The video on the left, I don't think is gonna play first, but that was the first one. And then this middle video is the second one. So. I am just literally popping boulders out of there. <laughs> it was really cool. So I can feel them in the bladder and I'm just literally popping them out. Um, and then in the middle one, because that was the second, I'm putting my finger in and just feeling around. And then we do copious amounts of lavaging and put a catheter down and flush them all out. And on the right was her collection of rocks in her bladder. 
This is Jasmine. She also came in for frequent UTI and bloody urine, and we found the same thing. She had a, a lot different pattern. She had a lot smaller stones and some big stones. So this was hers. You get to see this one from the beginning. Sometimes I use a blade, sometimes I use my laser. And that was my daughter's baby spoon when she was a baby. <laughs> and just, just full of all these different stones. I'm gonna play the second video because I'm now using my finger to feel the ones that are left and getting them out. And then after we're sure there aren't any left, then we sew her back up and you can see all these strew bite stones. We send them off for analysis so we know what they are. And then we do dietary changes and try to get the owners to be compliant on all the different things that they need to do so they don't come back. This one was, after watching the first two, number three was really unfulfilling. That was the only stone that this dog had. Um, and I think that one was calcium oxalate. All right, we're going to get into some foreign bodies. This is a Malinois, which are very hyper and aggressive dogs. So this dog came in, ain't doing right. That's what ADR is and vomiting. So we took x-rays. We saw a foreign body. This is inside surgery. We found the, the portion of the gut where the foreign body was. And I'm incising. I still didn't know what the foreign body was, but I could feel it was nice and hard. How fun is that? And then we sew it back together again, of course, and the bowel was fine. We were able to not have to do any kind of a re anastomosis resection. And it turned out that it was some kind of a hard a rubber. I don't know what he chewed it. off, but it appears to be some kind of a, something like off of a tire or a something. Rubber, so the next day he felt better and he bit my technician. We were happy to send him home. So this is another intestinal foreign body, but I'm incising the intestine with my laser. So I'm sure kids are very similar. The things that these guys swallow, that was a bottle cap. And it's just, it's not funny, but it's really kind of sad the things that they get into. So this is Cash. He's a 12 year old Labrador cross and he had eaten the son's tube sock. Of course, we'd already done ultrasound and radiographs. This is the sock coming out. So fun, no damage to the intestine. You, if you look at the left side of it, the sock had actually folded on itself. And that may be one of the reasons it didn't pass through. Well, you would think Cash learned his lesson, but oh no, six months later, he comes in with the same symptoms. And sure enough, he swallowed another tube sock. So this time we decided to do a little bit more of a workup because for a 12 year old dog to all of a sudden start eating things was a little more unusual. And we found out that he had several deficiencies and toxicities that we addressed. And so far he hasn't been back, which is a good thing. I don't know what is so appealing about eating socks and they were dirty socks to begin with. So there's 
You can actually watch it come out of the intestine. You look above, you can see it just slip right out. So cool. And then we get the bottom half and we are done. This was a dog that ate a scrunchie. So that's the scrunchie below. And then we went ahead and neutered him while we were there. This was Bon Jovi, and he was a dehorning that went bad, got very infected. The owners were not able to get it under control, so he came into our clinic, and we were doing ozone. <laughs> so we're using ozone flush, I'm just rinsing the head with the ozone. And then laser, and it healed up beautifully. This was Athena. This is a heartbreaking case. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers my story, but I was told that my horse couldn't be saved. And then my vow after that was to never tell somebody there's nothing more that can be done. So this young girl shows up with this puppy and she said, everybody has turned her away. Nobody will help her. They say, just put the dog to sleep. And will I help her? And my first reaction was, this is pretty bad. <laughs> I don't know that we can do anything. And I caught myself and I said, you made a promise don't go back on it now. And so we started treating her. The history had been that she originally been attacked by one of their other dogs in the house when she was three months old. And the veterinarian put her on, on an antibiotic and she got somewhat better. But then the owner said she fell off the bed. They thought she landed on her face, took her back to the same vet. They retreated with antibiotics and all of a sudden her face started to necrose off. So I was suspecting that she had toxic epidermal epidermal necrolysis and it turns out i was correct and so we were doing wet to dry bandages we were trying to do debridement we got her to looking really good on the right hand side but she had no eyelids left so she had all this exposure keratitis so we i called in two plastic surgeons and i asked if they would do this and they said they would come in and they did it as a, a freebie however before they did the surgery they had taken my staff aside and told them to start her on an antibiotic in preparation for the surgery and they didn't say anything to me and they put her on an antibiotic and she relapsed and uh, didn't come back she got septic her joints got all swollen it went into her lungs and her sinuses and we could not stop the reaction at that point but she was cute as a bug this was her getting better this is an intestinal intussusception on a puppy. Uh, typically parasites are gonna be the number one cause in puppies. So we have to figure out where the tunnel was, you know, what part was actually tunneled on what other part. And there you can see the lower end on the lower half. So I'm gonna let this play through because we were able to actually milk it out. It was really cool to watch. Uh, we did have to do a resection of the bowel because the part that had been in the anastomosis in the uh, intussusception had already rotted so there we are pushing it back in we're going to milk it out so the owner had just really waited a very very long time to address the puppy's symptoms Just even trying to figure out the anatomy here was challenging. But here you can see we're reducing the intussusception. And the liquid that squirted out was where the bowel had already ruptured and necrosed. very unhappy intestine. We're almost there. Yay, we got it. So we just had to resect all that necrotic bowel. This case, uh, I always present this to my veterinarians who are taking my training course because 
you would never have suspected this. This is actual friend of mine's dog. She came in on a Friday night because she had not been acting well all week long. And we took x-rays and we saw that she had some fluid in her chest. Uh, her blood work was abnormal, differentials included, Addison's disease. Uh, it was a weekend, so we couldn't get her in to get a CT scan. I had lung torsion was a possibility, pancreatitis. So we decided to treat for a treatable. We treated her with some Percortin to see whether or not it was Addison's. But by Monday morning, she was actually worse. The fluid in her chest was worse. I sent her to a surgeon to get a chest tube placed so we could drain her chest. And we'd already ultrasounded and done an echo. On the way back from the surgeon, the owner stopped to get something to eat and the dog passed away in the car. So they continued to come over and I decided to do a necropsy on the dog. So my daughter started to do the necropsy and she said, oh, this dog has a broken rib. I can feel something hard and sharp. So I just had her stop and I went in and it turns out that she had eaten a chicken skewer. They had had chicken skewer on the Barbie uh, earlier in the week before. And when she swallowed the chicken skewer, nobody noticed it was gone. And instead of it going all the way down the esophagus into the stomach, it had somehow made a turn and it literally went through her heart and uh, came out the other side. So um, I, when I finished doing the necropsy, I could actually feel it. And I, I wish I would have had my camera because I didn't realize what I was going to be pulling out. And I literally pulled this all the way out. It was just migrating its way through the heart, which is why she had all that frank blood in her chest. We went back and had our internal medicine person analyze the ultrasound of the echo and they couldn't see it. Uh, so it was really sad, but anyhow, what a diagnosis. This was Pippi. This dog was less than two years of age. It was a Roddy Boxer uh, cross. This dog had had chronic diarrhea since the owners had gotten her. And because she was very aggressive, not very many veterinarians wanted to work with her. Well, we didn't really understand what was going on at first, but we started doing a workup on her and her radiograph showed that she had this big old huge blockage in the intestine. Ultrasound confirmed it. We decided to go do an exploratory and keep in mind this dog had been this way for over a year and a half. So apparently what happened is she developed a stricture somewhere in that uh, ileocecal colic junction area and things were just getting impacted over time and it had a lot of inflammation what we're seeing being held up at the top of the screen is her uterus and her uterus just adhesed to this mass so we cut it out uh did an anastomosis of her intestines. okay so we're going to cut into this this was the mass this was the proximal port uh this was the distal portion so actually laid like this. This is exiting the colon. This was coming back up into the small intestine. This is the ileum that was distended. So this is how much bowel we ended up taking out until we got into more normal. All right, here's D-Day. It's definitely an impaction in here. It's that hair and seeds. Shoe. So my the summation was that she had early on developed a stricture because things weren't able to move through normally. Uh, she was just piling this up over a long period of time. The bowel became dilated, and the mm. only thing that could get through was the liquid like diarrhea. The on that, the, uh, uh, she did really well for really quite some time after jump. that. So we're almost done. I hope you're not too grossed out. But I have to leave you with two really fun cases. This is a D. She was a six-week-old English cream golden retriever that came in because she had this big lump on her belly. Mm. So this is a, a large pouch. Feels like it's intestines. I can reduce it by compressing it. Feels like there's a whole gap here in the wall. I don't even actually feel the edges of all of the hernia. And when she stands, 
you can really appreciate how large of a defect that is. So we gave the owner of uh, the breeder a price for the repair and she said, well, how much does it cost to put her to sleep? And I just looked at her and thought, I cannot kill this adorable little puppy for a hernia. So we offered her to surrender the dog and just pay the cost of the euthanasia. And she was thrilled to say yes. However, she never paid the cost and we kept the dog and we fixed the hernia. And this is Adi meeting Lily. Remember Lily's the horse that took me into alternative medicine who is still in my backyard. So there they are meeting for the first time, becoming friends. This is Alyssa, her new mommy, <laughs> my daughter. Um, and uh, post-operatively, she slept on the floor with Adi. Uh, she did have some complications in the beginning because when we closed the hernia, there was no space. Like this thing had been so big for so long. So she was having a lot of reflux. We had to really work to get food to go the right direction. So here they are just constantly hanging out together, quite in love with each other. And there is a D on the right helping to put together my raised beds with Alyssa. And then, because I live in a food forest, um, <laughs> we came out one day. We have rabbits, and we have turtles, and we have snakes. But this time, we had an alligator in our yard. So this guy literally climbed right. the fence to get in my yard. He is blocking the mulberry tree. He is inside my fence. And he is huge. I don't know how he was able to fit in. We have a security breach security breach he climbed the fence and so i had called a trapper to come out but i was very adamant that they were not to kill him and i wasn't outside when they came because i was doing a podcast that night so my daughter was in charge of making sure they didn't kill the alligator and uh they felt so bad they were taking him to a meat farm and they felt so bad that they had to lie to me that they decided to not kill him and they called me back and said you know would you like to be part of his release so we released him on my property in Dade City. I, I'm on the Withlacoochee River. I've got 63 acres. So we decided to let him go. But it's really cool, the behavior of these guys, when they uh, feel like they're going to either be threatened and or they're killing their prey, they start to roll. So you're going to see him as they start to walk him down to the river. Um, he decides to have a different concept and they just start to roll. That's how they kill their prey, by the way, <laughs> if you ever get in a tangle with a alligator. So we take them down to the river. And uh, after this experience, the couple uh, has become very dear friends of ours. So they're gonna kind of walk them down to the water's edge. Maybe slide him down to the water's edge. We're almost there. A couple more rolls as we go. And this is uh, the most dangerous part of the release is they have to take the noose off. <laughs> so you... Uh, you have to really know what you're doing and be pretty experienced. As you can see, I was quite a bit further back, zooming in on my camera. So now they're gonna get ready to get him to go a little backwards. A little closer to the water. Oh, he sees it. He's ready to go. He's going to dart off, but he's still hooked. And as he slips away into the water, we end our presentation. Good night. Okay. I hope that was fun. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Well, maybe not as technical, but quite enjoyable to see. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's good for us, our, our crew, to see you know how you know some someone else lives, and you know we we talked about this one other time when you were on. 
Um, you do a lot of the stuff we would love to do, you know, with, with, with seemingly less uh, red tape. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was really, really, uh, I, I always like listening, you know, love listening to you. It, it was really great. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. And now, we, I know we've had a few problems with our um, uh, platform here. Doug Leonard had his, has had his hand up. I don't know if that was just an accident or... Uh, I didn't want to interrupt you. So, Doug, if you have anything to say, uh, now's the time. Thanks. Um, it was an accident, and uh, but the presentation was just phenomenal. Thank you very much. Okay. And I was I was thinking that I have uh, two daughters who would not listen to their dad at all about any of these things that I'm, you know, doing uh, on to people, but they would love to listen to you. And I'm going to uh, forward this uh, presentation to uh, to them about their pets. And it was just phenomenal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, there's there's one comment in the chat I think you'll enjoy from Mike Beamer. I have to talk, I'm going back to school. <laughs> you can use that if you want to use that on your on your website as a, as a, for a quote. That's a free testimonial for you, Doctor. Yeah, I think you can use that as a, as a testimonial. <laughs> I want to get that on video, Mike. <laughs> and I, you know, big shout out to Mike because he has been so gracious to donate the methylene blue for our cases. And Anytime I, you need it. Yep. Wow! Great. Yep. Yeah. Who knew, right? <laughs> yep, yep. Wonderful work. What a fantastic, nice. Well, to thank see you so much, nice. Marlene. And it, it's always, it's always really interesting to see, you know, what, what you're up to and, and and how you handle these, you know, cases and whatnot. Thank uh, you. I don't know about the rest of you. Maybe we went to the wrong school. I'm not yeah. sure here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you are welcome to come, and you can do food forest, or you can do the vet office, whatever you want. Uh, so, uh, anybody, um, anybody else have any comments or questions? And, and thank yeah. you, Mario. For Here and uh, uh, raw meat diet for the carnivores. These modalities that you're using on patients, it sounds like if you're doing everything, I mean, the economical, uh, I guess, outcome of that can be really be heavy. So how do you determine which ones um, you choose? Is it more of you ask the patient or yeah, the owner, how, what, what can you afford? Or is this more of really you packaging it all up in, ter in terms of your clinical decision making? I think there's a combination, you know, I can come up with the best clinical package and presentation, but if they can't afford it, then I try to find out what they have. And I, I truly try to put their cost into buckets because there's a certain amount they have to do in diagnostics. There's a certain amount they have to do in essential core nutrients and then supplements that are more specific for that condition, whether it's a cancer or whatever, and then uh, the therapies. So if I can get them to even buy equipment and do it at home, it's so much more economical. If they'll buy an ozone, like an ozone kit, a hummingbird kit, and be able to do ozone and hyperbaric at home, that $10,000 that they spend will save them way more because then the animals can be getting two dives a day and they can be getting their ozone and they're not having to come in uh, to the office and all that extra time that they're having to either leave the pet or drive back and forth. And a lot of my cases come in from all over the country. So it's, it's important that they be able to go home and maintain their therapies. There one thing that there's it's like a must do for you. Like I, I see you were promoting uh, for the first part of your slides with the Magnosphere. Is there, is there like a must do for all of these cases and the other ones can be combined uh, in the protocol? They have to get parasympathetic. So I have a couple of different ways to do it. I got a Magnusphere Uber years ago and I've been working. I actually got to work with Dr. Jacobson directly before he passed away. So, you know, my passion, of course, being able to pick his brain and get trained by him is beyond the imagination. The man was beyond brilliant. So that is one of my favorite pieces of equipment, but I also do other frequency modalities. We have things that the parents can do at home so that they maintain that parasympathetic state. So before starting therapies, you need to make sure that they're in parasympathetic through these devices. And, and what's really interesting is not just them. It's not the pet, it's the pet parent because that pet will entrain to the emotions of their pet parent. The ones where the people are grounded, they have good outlook on life, they're positive, they 
our um, glass half full, not half empty, those animals always do well. The ones that are fear-based, a lot of guilt, shame, a lot of baggage that they're coming in from the past. And this is just another one of those experiences that's full of anger and fear and bitterness and shame. Those And those are not going to do well. <laughs> and it's just really interesting, the emotional component to that. And Tony Jimenez is really from Hope for Cancer is also a dear friend of mine. And, and he talks a lot about that on people that if you can't get them to shift emotionally and find gratitude and joy and, and love and compassion, then it's really hard to shift them out of that state uh, for a combination of reasons. And so the pet isn't training to whatever the pet parent is doing. I personally believe that the animals are a reflection or a message, if you will, to the pet parent on things that they need to heal and learn and resolve. So I think of it as a computer program. If you turn your computer on and your files are taking up all your space and you need to make space, you have to open your files, you have to decide what you're going to delete, and then you delete it and you put something else in its place. And emotions are very similar. I think the reason that we have that range of emotions is so that we can recognize those low vibration frequencies, not to have to be immersed in them, but to be able to recognize them and decide, do I want to get keep it? Do I want to get rid of it? Is it serving me a purpose? It did it one time. That's why it's hardwired there. But now I'm ready to do something different. And it's so really rewarding to work with pet parents who get that. And they want to make that transition for themselves along with the pet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got a great presentation. Uh, Dr. Stewart was asking, can you elaborate a little bit about the food forest or is that a whole nother topic? You, oh, no, I can elaborate. I, I live in a regular little subdivision. Uh, we don't have a, a, what do they call it when they tell you what you can do and not do? Uh, we don't have a... HOA. Uh, HOA. Yeah, we, we're not in an HOA, but I'm in you know like a, a regular third of an acre. And I'm just passionate about growing food. So over the past, I've been in this house now 31 years. And so I've been adding plants and trees and mulch and soil and horse manure, <laughs> you know, year after year after year. And so now um, it literally is a food forest. Um, I can do a presentation on it if anyone was interested, because it's, I think as we progress into these talks of food shortages and just the quality of food that we really need to do something where we're in charge of growing something on our own, even if it's only herbs or maybe some greens or, you know, having fruit trees or avocado trees, you know, whatever it is, but being able to be somewhat self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. And it helps mother earth because, you know, at the end of the day, if we don't keep our planet alive, there's not a planet for us to stay on. So we really have to start being more mindful about the world that we live in and being able to go out and just even pulling weeds. Uh, Zach Bush talks about the multi billions of microbes that you put in and on your body by just pulling weeds. So now you get a rich soil and all that experience, plus your grounding, plus you're having gratitude, plus you're in the sun. You know, that's, it's just plus, plus, plus. So I have avocado trees. I have a bunch of different citrus. I have macadamia trees, um, a variety of different cherries, uh, passion fruit, dragon fruit. Um, oh, I have um, right now uh, jackfruit. <laughs> my jackfruit tree had babies for the first time. Oh, my God. The jackfruit is already, I mean, it's humongous. And there's like six of them on the tree. So I'm so thrilled. It's a 10-year-old tree, and it's finally producing and and then of course um raised beds with all kinds of different vegetables and herbs and a lot of medicinals so i grow a lot of medicinal foods and then make medicine from that uh, you know we have nettles and we have uh, spanish needles and we have oregano and um oh my gosh i can just keep going on and on it's a whole world in and of itself i just harvested sugar cane and not that it's healthy but um i just made uh, cane syrup and the most amazing taste and i It'll probably last me two years, but because you only take a little tiny bit, but the flavor is incredible. And you made it, you grew it, and lots of gratitude. Great. That uh, I'm just making sure I I, I, I put this down. I'm going to, for, for the archives here, if I ever eat a sock, I'm calling Dr. Siegel. I'm <laughs> waiting on my screen here, so... <laughs> 
That's a keeper. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else have any comments or questions? Um, right, Marlene, terrific as always. And, and thank I you so much for your time. It's so much fun to share, and I appreciate everybody's enthusiasm as we <laughs> as we celebrate our fur babies. Thank you so much, and it's it, you know very very uh, always great and always interesting. Um, next week uh, we have Dr. Dizel uh, is going to be speaking on precision psychiatry to improve mental health. So back back to the people stuff <laughs> anyway. Um, but I'm sure you probably have some some uh, some interesting. Uh, uh, thoughts to share on that also, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's all about trapped emotions. And mm -hmm. I think the emotions play a bigger role than any other process. Okay. So, so that's next week. Uh, again, if anybody is um, uh, interested in, in, in uh, presenting something, please let me know. Um, and uh, we're coming up, uh, we'll be visiting uh, Dr. Farshian in, in in Miami, uh, February 9th to the 11th. Um, and, uh, in the area, just stop by at the, the Hyatt Regency. Um, and uh, that's that, I guess, for now. Um, sorry about the, the platform. We're still working on it, and uh, we'll do better next time. <laughs> well, now you know, don't use Safari. You need to use Chrome. And, and you probably should mention that, uh, like, Safari was all whacked out. Okay. All right. Uh, great. Okay. Yeah, that's what we have. So last week's video, uh, it had all, <laughs> it was ridiculous. It had, uh, it was, apparently the, 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 the video part was on another uh, tab in, on my computer and it all, it, all it videoed was, uh, we got the audio fine, but the video was just, just the uh, uh, email that it was open to the whole time. So we're still trying to at least get the audio separated there. So tonight I only had one one tab open, even though I'm sorry I was late. Uh, we got a little bit a little bit uh, bollock stuff. But anyway, okay. Next week we're going to have uh, precision psychiatry. Um, Dr. Siegel, terrific as always, and um, Dr. Hartman was a little bit uh, grossed out by some of your pictures there, but uh, he's a big boy; he can take it. So. <laughs> I don't know. You still here, Stefan? I don't think so. So uh, that man eats raw beef heart. He cannot yeah. be grossed out. He eats <laughs> raw beef heart. <laughs> All right. And Thank again, again, Mike Beamer had the had the had the saying of the week, right? So we know who to call if anybody ever eats a sock. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Marlene. It was terrific. Okay, everybody. Good night. Good um, night, we'll everybody. See you next week. And uh, same time, same station. We'll see you again. Thank you again. Terrific. Bye.